What does it mean to be considered the spiritual successor of EverQuest? And yes, at this point, that is a, a title that's kind of getting thrown around a lot lately. I think that's partially due to just how much EverQuest impacted the genre. But to that end, what does the creative director of Pantheon, Chris Joppa Perkins, think made EverQuest great? Join me for part two of this multi-part interview in which I get the creative director of Pantheon killed over and over. Uh, and we, I mean, we, we have died a lot, <laughs> to be fair. Oh, we've died a lot. Oh, we've died a lot. Oh, we've died a lot. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to get invited back to do this again. So, th so this might be it. This is probably the last time. So let's enjoy it while we have it, okay? <laughs> In this section of the interview, we talk about limited action sets. We talk about ropes and floats and climbing and the importance of music in Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. We even talk about one mechanic, one mechanic that was going to be great, but actually turned out to be kind of not so great in practice for a really good reason. So I'm really glad that it was not included in, in Pantheon. Holy shit, it is still surreal that I got to do this. Well, this is nuts. I'm actually getting to play the game that largely inspired me to start content creation, not just by myself, which I've been able to do a lot, but actually with the, the creative director, Chris Joppa Perkins. Chris, Chris Joppa Perkins, would you like to say hello to everybody? I would love to say hello. So hello. <laughs> and so Joppa has never grouped with me before, so he is unaware of just how terrible I am at this game, but he will soon find out, uh, as I'm sure we will die multiple times. But is, is, is that why the, uh, the death penalty hasn't been on this whole time, just, just for me? You know, it's it's never a good idea to uh, you know, fully unveil to a single person how much they matter. Um, but yeah, the, the truth is, because of you and you alone, uh, we've decided to remove the death penalty for everyone. And you know, be careful with that knowledge. Uh, don't let it don't let it get to you too much. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I appreciate it very much. All right, so we don't have a full group. We have yourself. You are a you're a cleric, correct? Yes, I am. And I am Gandalf, also known as a wizard with a sword. Also known as Arcane Beard Flynn. Yes. <laughs> as as he is colloquially known. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I am a cleric. I have no GM powers active. I have no uh, stats or abilities or gear that is, you know, beyond what is, is uh, you know, somewhat viable for this level. So we should be uh, au natural. You you asked me to um, kind of take you on a little bit of a journey, as it were, of of what season two is about and maybe get a little bit more insight into Avenger's past, this massive zone that season two is taking place in. Um, and so I'm going to try to do that today and uh, feel free to, you know, it, it's a tour, I guess, but you're also free to take us wherever you want to take us. If you see something you want to talk about or look at or anything like that, just, just let me know. Um, I've actually, what I'd like to do, because I've been seeing a lot of people, if we want to just start heading this way, at least at first, I've seen a lot of people taking on these bandits over here, uh, just kind of out near the, the dragon shrine. And uh, I have some, some tuning that I, I want to do on them and some things that I want to tweak. And I actually... I've been meaning to get in and get a little bit of fresh first-hand experience fighting these. So, well, we, we got to take on a couple. We've got That'd some uh, experience right here with hey. aggro. <laughs> there we go. Things are moving already. Oh, nice. Yep. There we go. That'll work. Let me. Uh... Oh, you've got you've got multiple friends here. Yeah, I think. See, see, I did at least warn. You did. I. This is also helping me get my uh, key bindings. I realize that my key bindings are not what they need to be right now, so... See, in my defense, the the snake was hidden in the grass. Mm -hmm. But I, I will point out that the reason why I knew I had aggro wasn't actually visual. It was audio. The entire reason why I knew is because the, the that music came on. 
Yep. Isn't that great? It, it is. It's something that, uh, I mean, honestly, in a lot of MMOs, I will often turn off the audio, but it's one of the things that I've I've praised regularly since since getting to play a lot is the audio is so good and so important to, to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've done a fantastic job and it and it goes a lot deeper, I think, than people realize, because not only does the music change when you get into combat, but it actually uh, is affected by what level the thing is compared to you. So if you're fighting, you know, something like the snake, which is what is this? This is the same level as you right now, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, no. Dark blue six and you're level eight. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually lower level than you. The, the music that is going to play is going to be a little bit more mild because of that. But were you to fight something even level, it would be a little bit more intense and actually musically be a little bit different as well. If it's, you know, a few levels above you, same thing. It'll change again. If it's red, uh, then if it's kind of like a low red, then it'll really start getting into some intensity and some big, you know, taiko drums and, and whatnot. And if it's way higher level than you, then it's at its most intense. And so there's actually a lot of depth with how they've done that. Uh, and they're so good at kind of creating these textural variations of music, uh, not only for the combat stuff, but even just for zone themes and ambient music. They they really do a good job of taking a, a theme and creating all these little splinter themes off of it. It's really cool. I have uh, I got to experience for the first time a little while ago the, the this thing is going to kill you uh, music. And it is intense. <laughs> I knew immediately that, like, oh, I messed up. <laughs> I'm in trouble now, and I need to run. And that's I you, th things also sprint, not just you. So I found that out as well. But it was it's it's such a a very interesting thing that I I don't think as I've seen done to this extent, where especially in a world like Pantheon, which is 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 big on danger and having music be a almost a tool you can use to kind of be aware of what's going on like instead of waiting to to um con the the mob that just added or something like that you get some ideas from the music that you're you're in or, or you know it's it, it may be a little bit too late but, <laughs> but you still get an idea mm. yeah it is really cool mm -hmm. it, it's one of those things that was always like it would be really cool if we could do this, but obviously it takes it takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of knowledge, musical knowledge, uh, engine knowledge for the engine they were using. Um, and uh, PVL, it took PVL, PVL to yeah. pull it off. So we've got it and we are benefiting from it significantly. I love yeah. what they did with Mad Rod as well. They, uh, I would I would advise or maybe not advise, but I would encourage anybody if, if you're actually in and playing a Mad Run to at some point, just turn the music off, like go into your audio options and turn the music slider all the way down momentarily and just listen to the kind of ambient noises that they've put in there. Um, not only is it really well done, but it actually, it, without giving away kind of how, uh, it, it kind of speaks to the lore of the area and what's really going on in there a little bit if you listen carefully to that, oh, okay. uh, that ambient audio. It's very interesting. I... Uh... The, the last game I remember playing where I paid that much sound to ambient noises is, um, oh, no, I'm blanking on the name. The, uh, Dark and Darker, because you had to, because if you didn't, you, <laughs> you were in a lot of trouble. And it was That's actually, right. uh, there's another one like that that came out recently, and it was one of the things I really noticed is they didn't have the, the ambient noise dialed in the same way. It makes here. a huge difference. Let's see if we can get this So what you just showed there, I want to highlight real quick, right? So there is a way to go through the gate. Oh, and I'm dead. <laughs> but there is a way to go through the gate. And doing that has an extra extra threat, right? Because there's a lot more Gadai over there. But by using climbing, you were able to climb up on here. Obviously, you could it's possible to jump up there too, but it it showcases some of the ability to find different ways like if you look past my corpse over here to this side could have climbed up this way as well 
and I think that adds more dimension. I, I was I, I admit I was skeptical at first about climbing, adding much to the game. I have eaten my words a couple times over now, and I think it, it adds a ton at this point. Good. Yeah, it's funny because, uh, you know, I don't know what people expect to hear from me on it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very aware that there's a lot of mixed opinions out there about it, and I'm certainly not coming from the angle of, you know, see, <laughs> like, see how great it is. It's not going to be the, you know, the, the, the ultimate feature for several different kinds of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not, and, and I totally get that. Um, but I, I do challenge, you know, someone who is able to play the game um, to to really articulate why it is that they don't feel like it really adds anything. Because I think the reality is, and it will only become more and more so as the game grows and climbing becomes a little bit more refined uh, in terms not only of, of the controls. I'm just going to go ahead and let this thing kill me. Um, <laughs> because it is, I don't even think I can take it down anyway. But yeah. um, it, it, not only as far as the controls go with you know, improving how you can actually climb down, um, from places or keeping from being yeeted off the rock in certain situations but once we were able to also get in things like surfaces and you know how that affects your ability to climb um, making it harder or easier how did I get revived oh, oh. did they hey are they saving thank us you so much <laughs> I'm uh I have no way to help you though I have no mana wait are they even are they sitting to pull Tagra they tried <laughs> <laughs> they tried to save you, Jaffa. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist to save you. That's fair. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. I, oh, no, I, no, I have no mana. Yeah. Now everybody's going to die. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. See, again, oh, no. The, the lack of death penalty currently in game comes into play. So everybody testing Pantheon, you're welcome. Instant cast on oath bug. Interesting. Okay. See, already finding bugs. You're you're a QA tester now, Joppa. Yeah, yeah. What I was gonna add about the the climbing is I think it like initially for me, and this is this isn't like shade towards any another MMO, but because I mean it was two thousand four, maybe two thousand five, but EverQuest two was what I originally thought of when it came to climbing. And the way that they did it was still like kind of revolutionary at the time but it was these these tracks right so like you there was one way to go and that was just how you did it so it basically replaced stairs in a lot of places it was still cool um and they did like expand upon it later but that's an, that's really what it came where i think a lot of at least my personally my uh hesitancy with the climbing came from is is mm -hmm. how unimpactful it was in everquest 2 and and like I said, I've been pleasantly surprised uh, with how it works. I, I do continue to try and um, jump up on the walls and hide from things and they still find me. But <laughs> mm. yes, yeah, 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 yeah. It, I mean, it, it has worked before, though. It has worked once before. I've been able to not like they don't they still see me, but they don't like climb up fast enough to get away. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's it's you know that that aspect of it is still a little rudimentary at this point, and I think it's it's those kinds of things that ultimately will give people if they're filling out a scorecard mm -hmm. would, you know, maybe give climbing some mediocre marks mm -hmm. at this stage, um, because those things do kind of mar the experience a little bit. But you have to you have to try and see ultimately where it's going to to land in terms of once these things are working fully as intended, they're ironed out, they're smoothed out, polished. It's going to provide a an extra dimension of gameplay, and I think speaking, uh, I think maybe a little more high level about some of the ideology and, and the thinking behind creating something like Pantheon is that part of the opportunity of the seizing of the moment, if you will, of creating a spiritual successor to a game like EverQuest is not only capturing what made EverQuest great but it's also creating an experience that's going to give Pantheon its own kind of longevity. Um, enough an additional dynamics that as, as much as we can are, are, don't feel tacked on uh, 
to the experience, but are, are actually, you know, uh, significant layers that are going to help it have its own longevity and lasting, make its lasting mark. And, and a lot of it is, is inspired from things like, th these are the kind of things I wish I could do in EverQuest. Uh, it, it is maybe as weird as that may sound, you know, the, it, it, there's a point in EverQuest where as much as I love that game, fundamentally my favorite MMO, fundamentally the most inspiring game there is in terms of, of what's actually working itself into the DNA of, of Pantheon, um, th there are things now, having played it as long as I have, that, man, I wish that I could do this. I, whether we're talking about the perception system, whether we're talking about something like climbing or the way the underwater content could be developed out more, these are all areas to take it further and uh, create, like I keep saying, that helping it have its own lasting impact um, beyond its spiritual successor form, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think one of the things, and I, and I don't know, because I have not played a rogue, so I don't know if this is in or not, but I do remember in the past, it was talked about with rogues, one of their utilities being uh, dropping a rope so that they could they could climb and assist people that were not as good at climbing in getting places. Is that still something that is planned for the game? Is it is it in the game? It's not in, okay. but it is absolutely still planned. The, all of the traversal mechanics we've talked about, the vine woven bridge, mm -hmm. the, um, length of rope, uh, things like you know being able to, to break down certain barriers in the environment uh, through like warrior battering ram and stuff like that those are all still absolutely planned and part of the things we're considering building out the environment I hate the way that they just kind of like jump like that sometimes that's something we need to uh, to kind of suss out I don't know if you've noticed that I don't think I have <laughs> they'll just kind of like lurp like right underneath you and you have to kind of reposition a little bit yeah yeah they get a little close to the hitbox, I guess. Is close. yeah. It's a pet peeve of mine. I think mostly because I've been mostly playing a caster, and in groups, the goal is for them not to get close to me. So yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So I want to ask you because you you mentioned it, and I don't know if this is an easy answer or not. But you um, you talked about what made EverQuest great. Uh, can you, in an elevator pitch, let's say, tell me what you think personally made EverQuest great? OK, well, part of what made EverQuest great was the time. Mm -hmm. And that's there's a whole lot of unpacking you could do there. But I think most people know what I mean by that. Just what it was when it launched. And for me personally, how old I was mm -hmm. and uh, how impacted I was able to be by a world like that. So that's one thing that made EverQuest great. Um, but my, my shortest answer, I think, is uh, the way that the world opened itself up to you over time. As you progressed, as you became stronger, you were able to... Uh, the world almost kind of opened itself up to you and the things you were able to do places you were able to go and therefore the things you were able to see yourself and the way the game kind of set itself up to make you care about the things that you hadn't seen yet mm -hmm. uh, that that whole paradigm and the way they captured that secret sauce that x factor of creating a world like that um has to has, would would be my top answer uh, I don't think EQ had the most riveting combat experience <laughs> in the world, but I will say that it had an incredible, um, incredible supporting systems for combat, like aggro, like um, their resource management and pacing, uh, like even even some of the, the issues with like mob pathing and stuff became kind of these endearing aspects of what made combat really great. Mm -hmm. The trains, the um, you know how quickly you could get overwhelmed. I mean, uh, everybody everybody knows where they were you know, for at least one unrest train. You know, like the, that's just kind of like ingrained <laughs> in everybody's psyche somewhere. Um, so th those kind of moments add a lot. Um, I think 
the, the believability of the world. You know, it seemed like people were really living in the world. And, mm-hmm. um, but but I would always have to point back to just that fact that it, it made you, it rewarded you with with kind of rolling out more of itself to you as you leveled up and not in this weird linear kind of um, way, but this kind of like, man, where, where can I go? Like, where can I set out for today? And that just that feeling that something's going to be there that's interesting. And I think we can take that, capitalize on that um, uh, carefully because you can, you can overproduce something and you can kind of over gamify something. And that's, it's one of the beautiful things about EQ2. Sorry, this is way beyond elevator pitch. No, no, pitch. no. And you knew what you knew when I, you I said, you I said you elevator, said elevator pitch. pitch. You knew you knew it was going to go beyond <laughs> that. That's fine. Um, but yeah, like the the uh, there's a way to over gamify and try to take take an idea or take you know even a concept and try to thread it too perfectly or like let's try to recreate this. But the beauty of EQ is how much empty space, how much negative space, how how many places didn't have meaning. But they were just part of the world, and sometimes there would be. Uh, I, I think of North Row a lot with you know those those little towers and the pyramids and the things that were just mostly buried under the ground, or um, you know even the Spectre Tower for a while before you actually went over there. But even when you did, even when you went over there and you could go all the way up in it and whatnot, there were all these questions about what is this thing, and 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 you didn't have quests taking you to it. You didn't have you know you weren't completely overwhelmed with all of the information about it and that's part of what made it kind of jive with that sense of there's just so many things to find and, and explore mm-hmm. and it, it kind of feels like it's up to me you know yeah um so yeah i'll i'll leave it there i think there was even like there was i mean it was it it's one of the things i haven't seen in a lot of modern mmos is the the random nightfall giant in an area for for low level uh characters as well you know the the kind of like hint that there's more in a space where you are so instead of it just been you're you're talking about like the the um the specter tower well that was that was the specters were much higher level than the rest of the things in there and so there was a sense of danger but also a sense of i want to get high enough level to get to a point where i can find out what that is uh because i've seen it now and i want to come back you know, it's mm. this this um, this excitement and this desire to to want to explore and learn more for the sake of exploration and learning more instead of just trying to finish a quest that's going to give X reward and following the quest guide exactly. Quests are fantastic in a lot of ways, but there's also a uh, that whole linear path that they tend to follow, which takes away a lot of, a lot of times, if not done well. Uh, from expiration. 100%. We're actually gonna kill this. I think the I think the trick is let you tank. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me tank and let me um, let me use my weapon technique and yeah. I think the I think the secret is actually me not talking <laughs> while while we're fighting. That that makes it go a little better. One of the things that I've really been enjoying as I've been leveling up this wizard is the the addition of instant cast spells along with longer cast time spells and and additional things like um and needing to decide what i want to do like i still have my interrupt on my bar on my limited action set uh but also there's other things that i could add i could have more damage and things like that and uh i think that there's something i just want to talk about like the limited action set because a lot of times uh, some people <laughs> have very strong opinions about it, good or bad. Um, I'm personally in favor of it and have been really since I heard about it because of games I played in the past that tend to throw so many choices at you. It becomes a a very simple rotation, but a rotation you constantly have to watch. Um, can you is there anything you can say about what made you decided to go with the limited action set that I, mean, I guess hasn't been lots been said already, but yeah, well, trying to step away from rotations is, is a big part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm personally not a fan of rotations and <clears throat> I think it's one of those areas where we've seen that be the consistent approach in game after game after game that <clears throat> trying to step away from that 
and carve out a bit of a slower paced approach to combat that isn't so rotation heavy felt felt fresh and and feels fresh and something worth pursuing um and and then some of it is 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 that desire for a tactical gameplay experience and i'll be the first to say that we've still got more dialing in to do uh to to really make that the case but that's the goal and it's always good to have a goal and something you're aiming for and something you're checking against as you move along we want uh we want the decision of what you're using and what you have primed to be part of how you approach of how you approach the game and so there, there is that kind of deep design uh, framework in there of, of what we're trying to achieve tactically, uh, some of the decisions that we're trying to push players into making. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just now cresting the level 20 mark where mm -hmm. players are, are, some classes at least in their current state, are starting to have enough abilities in general to start getting a sense of how that feels. And that's only going to increase i mean you know the goal is that there's enough abilities where that decision is going to feel as meaningful as possible what you've got to sacrifice uh that i, I just think is compelling i think it's super compelling you're about to die home thank you and i i think that it's it's i definitely feel like it's getting there because i am making tactical decisions and that's kind of what i like in a game i'm deciding what i want on the bar uh and sacrificing something to get an advantage elsewhere. And I would decide based on hopefully you're not going to gonna die. You might die. I probably am. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like it's, it's important for me, like in this group, uh, as we actually do kill things to have snare, right? Because they're they're running that last time I tried to snare. It got resisted. They ran away, but at least I had the option to try and snare. And I, I could have swapped that out for um, another instant cast nuke or something like that, but it's a it's a tactical decision of what I want to do, and you can alter it based off of the group makeup, which I think is it's a compelling thing. And, and I haven't gotten to play as much as I'd like in full group settings, but I don't think there's going to be a time when I played in as much as I would like. So I want to see how it continues to grow and evolve, and. Obviously, I mean, you're having all this open testing to give feedback on what works and what doesn't work. But I'm mm -hmm. I'm I'm enjoying the the tactical decision making instead of having a bar with 10 to 15 abilities and just sitting there and clicking, clicking them all or getting a, a an MMO mouse <laughs> and clicking them all, all on the buttons. Um, I, I like yeah, I yeah. the gameplay that I have always enjoyed more is the. The, the bigger impact for small decisions, both positive and negative. That doesn't mean easier. That means, oh, I really messed up like that. Not hitting that snare, for example. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just the last thing I'll say on it is the, expect the potential for for tweaks mm -hmm. um, to how rigid it is or not. Uh, for example, one of the things I want to experiment with here soon is allowing players to uh, actually alter their worn equipment during combat. So allowing them to switch out a weapon or various things. Um, the the interesting thing with that though is that it, it your your weapon techniques are part of your abilities, and mm -hmm. so if you can't switch that out in combat, then switching weapons is less than uh, effective uh, because you can't actually utilize any of the weapon techniques that go with it, and so it's necessitated thinking through the idea of, okay, well, if we wanted to allow some some form of the ability to switch or alter your ability loadout, whether it's the complete loadout, whether it's, you know, single ability changes, um, what would that look like? You know, introducing a cooldown onto that and, you know, allowing players, could that actually help add even more meaningful choices where you have to make a decision about when you want to switch out ability, knowing that you can't do it again for a period of time, um, but you really need to switch to your, you know, two-handed hammer because the weapon technique that you need a stun and mm -hmm. you need a stun now. So that th there's, th we are trying to create that meaningfulness uh, of decision making now, but I think there's still ways to loosen that somewhat and not actually lose what we're trying to create as well. So. Um, 
that's part of the fun of, of game development to, to a degree is you get to kind of consider some of these different edge cases and how you might solve them and hopefully usually you're you're progressively making the game a better and better experience that's good that's great i uh, it got me thinking about a question i want to ask um and it doesn't have to necessarily be like strictly the uh, pantheon but is there a mechanic or a feature that you originally really thought was going to work great and you wanted it to to work great but then in practice you found that it just didn't work and you had to you you, you changed your mind about it i i healed you but it didn't land <laughs> i think i died before <laughs> i'm very good oh, at dying yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm very good at being distracted. I was asking you a question. <laughs> I'm, I am uh, I am sorry for for failing you, for failing you, Redbeard Flynn. Um, <laughs> a mechanic that I was excited about that when it was implemented kind of fell flat on its face. Mm -hmm. And okay, let me think about that for a sec. Let me thank these fine gentlemen. I'll meditate over at the Bindstone. <laughs> I'm actually that. gonna just like pull you to me. Okay. Um. I think relics was was one. Mm -hmm. uh, way back in the day, when th there was this little item you could have equipped and if you went into certain areas it would slowly fill up over time and once it got filled up and as it filled up more and more it, it gave you bonuses to certain things depending on what color um the the mana or the energy in that area was um it it sounded cool mm -hmm. and fun funny enough it, it was similar to a lot of ideas that we've we've cut along the way because as cool as something like that sounds maybe to some things like that just kind of become these these necessary things in this kind of era of the mmo we we want to min max we want to if, if there's a way to increase our fire damage then we're going to go to more we're going to want to go and sit there until our relic fills up with red <laughs> mana until it's all the way full so we're at our max capacity and it just kind of created this weird stepping stone yeah. before people felt like they could do what they wanted to do and, and there's been lots of things like that in various different ways that we've ended up walking back because um, it just felt like unnecessary minutia and didn't feel like the impact was worth the effort I can already see the the Discord message from your raid leader the night before a raid. Okay, you need to go. You need to go sit in this zone for two hours before a raid, or you're not going to be able to participate. Doesn't that sound fun? Yeah, <laughs> just sounds so fun. I mean, almost as fun as as you need to go sit in this one zone for twelve hours, <laughs> and then maybe maybe you'll get a spawn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Old aggro. I feel good about this one. I'm hopeful. I think we've got this one. I need to get a cold focus though. And then snare. I probably snared to her. <laughs> <laughs> that snare sure is effective. <laughs> it's holding them in place. <laughs> Okay, wait, wait. I've got, I've got an instant cast. Uh, there we go. Do it, nice. There, there we go. <laughs> there we go. That'll work. That one killed us like three times. We still have one more part of the interview still to go, and that'll be coming in the next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, if you want a couple more tidbits, a couple more visual things to see in Pantheon, some spaces that you may not have seen yet, even, even if you are a VIP, because there's at least one spot in part one, that not even a VIP, no one has seen save the devs until now. You can check that out in this video right here. My name is Redbird Flynn. I am uh, uh, shocked that I got to do this, but thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day.